Tom Brady's the greatest of all time. Tom Brady's the greatest of all time. I don't know. You know, I had my brother kind of had this insight. He thought, yes, Tom Brady's great, but I don't think he thinks he's the greatest of all time because he thinks that he happens to fit well into Belichick's system. It's hard to deny it. The guy's freaking good. So, uh, But whether he is the greatest of all time, you're too young to have watched maybe some of the – Clips from people like Joe Montana and uh, some other quarterback greats, but he's certainly probably one of the best of our contemporary quarterbacks. That's probably <laughs> pretty easy to argue. How about Iowa State, though? Yeah, baby. Thank you for bringing that up. <clears throat> Let's go, State. Let's go, State. So I was in Miami on. Ocean Drive Boulevard at a little friendly sports bar and grill on South Beach watching that particular victory. So that was kind of nice. Nice way to round out my intensive weekend. All right, so, um, so chapter four, uh, I believe it's four, yeah. Chapter four, Scouts, and you guys did chapter three. Uh, but we haven't discussed it yet, so <laughs> Chapter 4, Skousen is due uh, Wednesday before class, and I've talked about it then. And then we'll be going into 5 and 6, so if you wanted to roll ahead, you can. That'll be due um, Friday before class. So well, that's what's coming up in our Scousing book. Scousing book. <clears throat> uh, we've got your test. I deferred till tonight for Super Bowl Sunday. Some of you have jumped that opportunity and started ahead of time, so that's good. If you have good. after class, so you can set your own schedule. Uh, Paige, I'm getting a little feedback. Can you just mute your microphone? And, and Kimmy, uh, feel free to unmute and interrupt anytime. If you guys, if I don't see you, it's no big deal. Just interrupt me. I, I want to be interrupted if you got a question or something to say. Um, so today we are getting into some greater details with uh, financial regulation. So we're going to kind of take a deeper dive into uh, that area by starting off our next section, which is Chapter 10. <clears throat> and a lot of this is going to tie nicely, ultimately, into um, our other book that we'll get into later, the Allison. So any questions before we jump more? Well, I've already jumped. Yeah. We do have to do a mastery point before the first chapter of this. Ah. Uh, yeah, so um, so I was on the fence on that. That's the way I set it up for money and banking. Um, and I wanted to kind of experiment with guys on that. So that's the way it shows up. How did I do it the first time? I let one attempt first? Uh, oh, yeah, it was the homework. And then um, I don't mind experimenting this time with opening it up, I kind of thought I did. I was so busy with I set up all these things last week. You're saying right now it's you have to do, all you have to do the master points before your first attempt? Yeah. Okay. I think that's what I was thinking about dabbling with. Um, I don't mind relaxing that uh, this time, but I just to kind of because I would have liked to have told you, and I honestly I kind of thought I flipped it around. I was going to tell you that next test I was going to do that. Uh, just to kind of see how it goes and what you guys prefer. So if you email me, um, I'll try to remember on my own, but if you see that it's still set up that way, email me and I'll try to get it unclicked after after class. Yeah. I just want to be like really clear for myself. So you are changing it for this time. That's all. The first attempt. Right. The second okay. attempt, you'll need yeah. to take it again. Yeah. Or you'll have to get the mastery points. If you, if you would have done it. And, and uh, that was the thing I didn't tell you guys. Uh, one sec, Josh. Uh, I had really good results of how well people did on their second attempt. You guys jumped 20% on 
on your scores. So I took your average scores of those people who took two attempts and the average was like 55 or something. The second attempt to jump to like 74 or 75. So the second attempt after working through the mastery points really improved your grade greatly. So some of you who did not do the second attempt, I think kind of missed out on that. So leave yourself enough room. Um, and then the peop there was just a couple of you that did the third attempt, you actually increased another 10% on top of that. So those of you who are wondering, oh, is it really worth it to spend the time doing a third attempt? Well, another 10% of this data showed this time. So a 20% jump on the second attempt, 10% jump on the third attempt. So a little diminishing returns kicking in, but still some marginal benefit. Okay, any questions, other questions? Okay, Josh, what were you gonna ask? Well, let me see, now the good, the good part is, if you've got the mastery points, you're not gonna lose them unless you miss some of those questions on there. So you're still gonna have those additional attempts as long as you scored on those other attempts, you should be good. So that'll still work to your benefit. Plus you probably learned the material a little bit better anyway. Maybe. <laughs> now remember, once again, I've said this before, you do not have to do all the practice problems to open up another quiz attempt, remember that. So you've got the five question quiz, and then if you don't pass that quiz, you have to go get the mastery point. There's like 17 practice problems. You do not have to do all those practice problems, right? You just have to do one of them to open up the quiz again. Is it still set at 100% that you have to get on the last I will, let me, let me just check my settings. Not now, but after class. Because I have them set a little bit differently for micro, for principal's class and we made this class, so. Let me, actually I'll write it on the board here for myself. M D. <laughs> okay, anything else? I, I think the reason I did the study plan thing that way maybe was um, I thought the homework questions were kind of light um, in terms of coverage, so I thought the study plan would be good. But. All right, anything else? So. Financial regulation, chapter, they switched it over. This is chapter 10. We're kind of working, flipping back to chapter 10. So economic analysis of financial regulation. One of those regulations is Dodd-Frank that you may have heard of that is kind of on the potential chopping block during this deregulation concept that Trump is bringing in as, as our new president. Uh, so one of those things is Dodd-Frank and we're gonna learn a little bit more about that in this chapter, but we're also gonna more generally study all kinds of financial regulations. Why are they there? Do they really serve their purpose? Do we need them? Is it too much? Is it too little? So um, we'll kind of pick, pick, pick part. Um, so where does this come from? Kind of a very short history. What was a bank panic? Bank panic. All right, so they go withdraw the money. So we learned in uh, money banking and even principals class, the bank doesn't have all your money. If everybody comes at one time, the bank doesn't have enough money. Uh, to make that good. And so even, when was the Federal Reserve created? 1913. Now, what is FDIC? Good, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So FDIC insurance. That started in 1934. So the FDIC and the Federal Reserve actually serve different functions. The Federal Reserve, when it was initially started in 1913, served as the banker's bank. Why? Why did we call it that? Banker's bank. Okay, good. So they would make loans to banks that were in trouble, and potentially that would help 
uh, keep people's panic down. However, at that time, they did not insure their deposits. So how it worked was if the bank ultimately did go under, um, not all of the money was there and the creditors might have, or the depositors might have still lost some of their money. And so as a result of that, even though being the bankers bank helped reduce the number of bank panics and the number of uh, bankruptcies of banks, um, it, it kind of didn't fill that final gap of ultimately depositors might have money. Now, some would argue, what's wrong with depositors losing some of their money? I'll come back to that later, that maybe that's not something we necessarily have to do. There might be some consequences to having that. But the Great Depression um, was a time when people were hurting and they wanted to put more confidence in the banking system. And so the federal government instituted the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So bank panics <coughs> um, caused some banks to fail if um, short-term Fed loans were not enough. to keep the bank so yes they were there as the lender of last resort but that didn't necessarily mean that no bank was ever going to fail <clears throat> and so depositors would still have to go through a process similar to like bankruptcy right the bank actually owed them but the bank didn't have any money so Maybe just to use some easy numbers, if the bank had a million dollars worth of deposits and uh, they started to go under, if they uh, sold all their assets and collected low loans and everything, maybe they were able to get back 600000 of the million dollars worth of deposits, and then the people would end up getting 60 cents on the dollar, right? So that's kind of a, a liquidation process. It's very similar to how bankruptcy uh, occurs in the United States. If a company goes bankrupt that owes you money, then you're going to have a similar thing done. They'll go through the bankruptcy process, sell all their assets, have a big pile of cash, but the pile of cash isn't going to be enough to pay everybody. So the money will be paid back in a pro rata form to the to its creditors. So Kaylee owns owes uh, uh, has 50% of the total outstanding debt. Jake has 10%. I have 40%. So the big pile of money, whatever's left over, 50% of that pile is going to go to Kaylee, 10% uh, to Jake, and 40% uh, to me, right? So it's a pro rata share to the creditors, but ultimately all three of us got screwed because of the bankruptcy. Well, that's essentially what's going on with the bank because they got their money from depositors. So in a bank liquidation, so then bank fails, so depositors are entitled to a pro rata share of total deposits after the bank sells all assets through bankruptcy. So not to confuse things too much, bankruptcy, a lot of times we might say, oh, you're bankrupt, man. You know, and so that's not, people might say you're just out of money, right? You, you don't have any money to pay your bills. Oh, you're bankrupt. Well, maybe you can do some things with a short-term loan from Uncle Fred, uh, or Uncle Fed in this case, to make your bills happen. But when you declare bankruptcy, you've started a real legal proceeding where you brought in the federal government to help order, to help you go through the a process in an orderly fashion to pay back your creditors what you owe. So now the, uh, the court system takes on your case. 
and they help uh, orchestrate the sale of your assets. So bankruptcy is a legal proceeding that individuals can go through, businesses can go through, and the bank, of course, is just a business. So they're going to follow through this bankruptcy uh, proceeding. <clears throat> so the thing that sucks about this is that this can take a long time. So this may take a couple years. This may take uh, two years or more. And so not only did you lose your or whatever money you had, and now we can start talking about little grandma who's uh, 68 years old, and she had her money on deposit, her $10,000 at the bank on deposit, and that's what she was living off of. The bank went under. Yes, granny's going to get some fraction of that money back, but it might not be for two years until we go through this process. Okay? So in response to that, the FDIC concept was another – Oh, kind of a bailout, if you will, of, of depositors so that they don't have to go through this process. So FDIC, I'm not going to write it all out, but Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC was created in 1934. And so how it works is they're going to make the depositors' money good right away. So they're going to step in and make the, again, the bank might have been working with the Fed on some of this stuff, but they have this insurance policy where they are paying in premiums to the FDIC so that in the event of a fault, the FDIC pays those depositors back. So it really does function like an insurance, an insurance uh, policy. All right, and so then the, the, uh, the premiums that the banks pay are just a function of how many banks were going under. And so it's underwritten similar to a car crash with your auto insurance, right? How many claims are going out? Uh, your premiums are going to be set accordingly. So that's our, that's our FDIC. So FDIC pays all back 100% up to 250,000. Good. So FDIC is 250,000 currently. It used to be 100,000, by the way, uh, for a long time. I don't remember what the dates were, uh, but they ramped it up to 250 during the financial crisis. So that was one of the early moves that they did was they bumped it up to 250 for the financial crisis. All right, so um, let's just do a quick little example. Um, so this is called the uh, the payment method. Um, so let me let me make up one second here. So FDIC short circuits uh, bank failures and contagion effect. I'll come back to that one. <laughs> Through two minutes, through two ways. One I just kind of described was called the payoff method. We've seen that word before when we were talking about oh crisis and stuff. Contagion. What is what is implied by contagion effect? Remember that from any other things? Contagion. Okay, yeah. In, in what dance? Yeah. Is that what you said? And is it called contagion? Yeah, like when if I go down, then she's going to go down. 
Oh, cool. That's a new one for me. Thank you. I like that insight. That's worth an extra credit point. I will, re I will remember that one. Because that's a good way to describe it. Okay, so when you kind of mirror the next person to you and it kind of connects. So that, that's what it could, the, in this context, the contagion effect is, is how that might pass around and impact somebody else. So granny lost her deposit, now she can't pay her rent, right? The landlord can't pay their rent, so now they can't pay their electric bill or whatever. So then you've got this, these implications that kind of keep passing along uh, uh, people. So it's, it's similar, I, before learning uh, Kaylee's uh, contagion uh, example there, I just always thought of a, of a cold being contagious, right? You pass it along from one person to the next. You can kind of think of, of, of contagious as well. So the one method they do is through the pay, payoff method, which is what I described here. And then the second way is through assuming the bank. So this is the purchase and assumption method. Both have been used, but this one's not used as often. In the purchase and assumption method, the FDIC goes in and basically buys the bank. It takes over bank operations. And so it, it ends up trying to kind of work through uh, the apps on the books and kind of take over the bank. So just put a, a little note here, FDIC takes over operations. They don't do this one very often because this is pretty costly. But in some cases, um, if the bank is like maybe close to being solvent, but um, they think they can maybe correct something that's wrong at the bank, uh, maybe the leadership or something else, they might be able to step in and recover more money that way by taking over the bank rather than just to completely bail them out with the, with the money. All right, so those are the, the two ways. Um, after the bank pays out, if they use the payoff method, how do they get their money back? How does the insurance company get their funds back? Well, let me just pose that question. You guys can think about it. So if payoff method, How does FDIC get money back? So the first step again is they pay all the depositors. So they pay out deposits less than or equal to 250K right away. So kind of thinking about the process I walked you through here, what, what do you think goes on? Yes. Yeah, it, it, well, that's where it's different. It, it doesn't go all back to them. So, but, but yes, you got the right idea. So what, now that the, they're going through the bankruptcy process two years later, ultimately the FDIC is going to be right in line with any other creditors. Who else might have their handout to the bank that went under? If all of the depositors up to 250,000 got paid out, who would be left with their handout two years later in addition to the FDIC? What's that? The Fed, they could be out, yes. If the Fed had a loan that was defaulted on, you bet. The Federal Reserve could have their loan out with their handout, good. Who else? Other banks, so if there was bank-to-bank -bank lending with the federal funds rate, they might have got screwed. They might have been held out for a loan that was outstanding. So other banks, who else? 
the government, which might kind of cover the Federal Reserve, but there might be some, uh, some sort of payments back there. There might be some taxes. Uh, government taxes would be probably one thing. They had some outstanding tax bills. That might be part of what turned them over in the first place. Okay, anybody else that's still left? There's still one out there. Sure. Kind of related to this. Uh, yeah, uh, ultimately the shareholders would. They're going to be the very last to be paid in the chain, though. But you're right. Uh, in fact, I'll come back to that. So the owners of the bank would be, hey, man, if there's anything left over, I own this place. I'll take the leftovers, but good luck. They're, they're probably not going to get paid, but ultimately they would. Counts over 250. Yeah, this, over 250. So if you had 300000 on deposit with this bank, then you're screwed on the other 50, you gotta wait the two years. Your 250 gets right in hand right away, but then the other 50, you're gonna be in line with everybody else. Okay, so that's the process of liquidation. That's very similar to how a bankruptcy, well it is how a bankruptcy proceeding would, would go through too. All right, so they pay out the deposits less than 250,000 right away. And then step number two is they get in line, so to speak, they get in line with all other creditors for a pro rata a pro rata share of proceeds from sale. So who else is in line with them? So we've got uh, deposits, depositors that were over 250. Now they still get their 250 back, but any amount over 250. We've possibly got other banks that might have been hung out to dry. The Fed. The IRS, as far as other government entities. So there's all a bunch of people that the bank owed some money to, whoever those players are. <laughs> and if the depositors made up 10%, and the banks had 10%, and the Fed had, um, oh, I forgot my most important one. I didn't find just didn't write it because it was here. FDIC. So FDIC is going to be a large player in this. Let's put them at 70%. And what do I need here? Five and five, I guess, to make my numbers add up. This is my hypothetical distribution. 10% other depositors over 250, 10% other banks, 5% the Fed, 5% the IRS, 70% the FDIC. Then whatever cash is left over, that's what they're going to be paid back at. And then, as Eric was bringing up, if there happens to be anything left over, which there probably won't be, um, then that would go to the shareholders. But th these guys are going to be first in line to be paid. Okay, and as far as I know, I honestly don't know this for sure. I don't know if covered in your book, but as far as I know, there, there's no, there's for sure no preferential treatment to FDIC, but I'm not sure if there's preferential treatment to IRS and Fed, um, there is uh, for you guys personally. So if you declare personal bankruptcy, there's two, um, two things that are exempt, your IRS tax liability and your student loans. So don't plan on just failing on those anytime soon after you get your degree. So those are exempt. So the other creditors uh, would fall into line in a, in a pro rata sure, uh, form, I'm not sure if there's any preferential treatment here to any, any one of those groups. Okay, um, so questions on that? I have one. Yes. Really, it's just what's the word before share of proceeds? Share of proceeds. <laughs> pro rata. Yeah, you're oh, probably yeah, you. just a dash. I, I kind of added the dash later, but a pro rata, pro rata share. 
So prorated. Oh, all right, Kimmy. Looks like a dangerous puppy there. All right. So hopefully not getting distracted too much. Remember, you're supposed to be distraction free, Kimmy, on there. So if the dog can go elsewhere, uh, that'd be ideal. She was asleep. This really isn't a thing. She was asleep. Okay. Packing. All right. So okay. So let's see. Let's do. Um, let's do a quick little example. So data shows that ninety percent. Um, suppose a depositor typically gets. typically gets 90 cents on the dollar, which is approximately what happens with these bank. So the banks are usually monitored pretty closely nowadays. So they're trying to keep them solvent so that if there was a bank failure, if they sell all their assets. So this is high relative to probably what normal business would be in a bankruptcy. But the data they've got is that depositors can usually expect to get about 90 cents on the dollar if a bank goes under. So let's just say that a depositor typically gets 90 cents, um, uh, typically gets 90 cents on average if a bank fails. Um, how much did it get? How much did he or she get, if we're talking about a depositor, how much did he or she get um, from a liquidation if he or she had 350000 on deposit. So crank that one out for me. Shout out an answer as soon as you get one. Three hundred fifteen. How much? Three hundred and fifteen thousand. 315,000. No. Everybody get that? I'm seeing some head shaking no so far, Paige, but thank you. I'd say you get uh, extra credit for being a fast on the gun first person in, whether you are right or wrong. 340. Who said that? Thank you. Why? Because they get up to $150,000 and the idea is $100,000. Okay, yeah. So um, it could, it's going to come in two chunks. So you've got $250,000 of it is covered 100% because of FDIC. And so 100000 of it, we're hoping to get 90% of. So we're going to get another 90,000 back. Might be two years later. So if we get into a whole present value thing or something, it could get a little less than that, right? But on average, so we're going to recoup 340,000. <clears> but you're not going to feel real happy about that. So what's another way that you could 100% protect yourself if you were this depositor? Two accounts. So it is per bank, per bank. So you can't do two accounts at the same bank. So it's per depositor at a bank. I don't believe you can use a branch bank either. So you need to go, if you're at Wells Fargo, you're gonna need to go to First National Bank. You're gonna have to switch banks, but you're gonna have two bank accounts one with 250,000 at most, and you might have less, 
and then another bank with the hundred thousand, and then you're going to get a hundred percent of it back. <laughs> so that is how people's behavior changed post contract. What is that? Moral hazard or adverse selection? Moral hazard, right? So their behavior changed to only putting up to 250,000 at most in any one bank. And so they started to spread it out. Now that's good in terms of bank failures. So to that extent, that's, that's kind of working the direction we'd like it to, right? So if we're spreading our eggs out in one basket, then if any one fails, um, we're not gonna, the FDIC probably isn't gonna have to for everything or you'll get some of your money back. Well, I, I, <laughs> I take that back. Um, it's working for you, but does it work for the FDIC? No, because they're, they're still going to be exposed up to the, all of the deposits everywhere. Because, and that's what we see people doing is most people would put the uh, money out into uh, multiple accounts. So Wall Street gets this idea. I don't even know if this is Wall Street, but kind of Main Street banks. I, it's got to be Wall Street. And they started creating what was called sweep accounts. So a sweep account was set up to work around this FDIC. So you've got a big fat cat that's one of your clients at the bank that you know has a million dollars to the good liquid at any time. So you'd like to have that money in your bank account. And so one way to keep it in your account to kind of help serve your customer and keep, keep their money there is, let's say it was uh, 750,000. So, you can keep 250 in the account before the end of the banking day. So 5 p.m. when the bank closes, might have been 4 p.m., I can't remember what time for the sweep accounts. The banker will literally sweep your money, 500,000, out of the account and invest it for you in an overnight uh, security. So then overnight, you would earn interest on your 500,000 the next day you'd cash it out and it would be put back into the account. So it's called a sweep account. And that way the person, the fat cat who loved working with First National Bank and all their friends are there, they were able to keep their money at the bank by using the sweep function. So again, kind of a classic example of a workaround uh, that, that comes up every time there's a government regulation in place, then somebody sees a profit opportunity potentially or, or an opportunity to either work around that in some way to kind of get their way. And so the sweep account was one, one example of that. All right, questions or comments there? Yeah. Does the bank need to keep that in? Uh, they, there would be a service fee, but they were mostly doing it to help their customer just to kind of be a, a relationship thing, you know, because they'd rather have that money with them and serve their customer better. So there would probably be a small service fee, so most of the interest would go to the client. Because you are serving a, a wealthy, this is one of your top tier wealthy clients that you'd be helping to serve with the sweep account. So was there no risk in the overnight investments? No, because, well, they'd be good, it'd be like a US government bond or overnight, so something really no risk at all, yeah, yep. So our risk-free thing of the U.S. government, to, to the extent that that's risk-free, and like we like we studied before, they have a pretty good track record on paying back their stuff. So, um, but it would just be kind of an overnight loan, very similar to the federal funds rate. What banks do to make their reserves good, they borrow overnight. So part of this five hundred thousand was actually kind of getting into that system, um, and so some other bank was loaning to another bank, right? Because that that's all they're doing is they're taking money and lending it to Wall Street and with some other uh, player and was able to service them better. Yeah? That account doesn't make that much interest though because it's such a state that's kind of good it's more than the service charge. Yeah. Oh yeah, it would make them interest, yes. Yeah, so it would be more than the service charge. And in fact, every bank could set their own thing, but they probably would phrase it so we're gonna put it in at market rate and whatever we get, we get, and the service fee will come out, but, or they'll say there, there's no service fee. Because again, during the day, they've got access to that 500,000 as far as their liquidity and their balance sheet. So it kind of worked both well for their favor. 
All right, anything else? Okay, so government safety net. Uh, oops, I erased my note. So the government safety net in the financial world uh, were these two functions. The FDIC, since it's a kind of a quasi-government thing, and it brings up our two topics. Moral hazard. So moral hazard, on the moral hazard side, depositors do not impose discipline in the market. Financial markets, more specifically, but So when we have FDIC, depositors do not impose discipline. What the heck does that mean? How would we, it's moral hazard, so it's post-contract, right? So the way this is set up, the whole the way the FDIC insurance works, depositors do not impose discipline in the financial markets. How do you think? That is. What do I mean by discipline in this context? They don't like withdraw any of their funds if the banks are making like risky investments. Because okay, they know good. Back. Yeah, so in terms of providing yourself discipline, I, I wake up at 6 a.m. and I go get my workout. I work out for 30 minutes, right? I'm being disciplined. I, I'm being thoughtful about where I put it. If their bank is starting to be in trouble, as Kimmy was bringing up, um, they're not going to necessarily pull their money at all, right? They're, they don't really care because they're covered. And maybe more importantly is they don't shop around how a bank is performing when deciding where to put their money, right? Their money is totally safe. Other than maybe interest rate differentials, we might shop around at who's got the better rate on the, the, the depressing rate on our savings account, which might be all of a fraction of a percent here the last few years. Um, so we might shop around for that, but for the most part, do I put it into Wells Fargo? Do I put it in First National, Bank of America? Ah, eh, I don't really care. So we're missing out on that discipline. Now, on the flip side, tell me what that does for a market if there was no FDIC, if FDIC insurance. In other words, if people were thinking about the risk of the banks, talk to me about the discipline that comes about through a free market like that, where the government's not involved with it. What's gonna ha how does that market look different than it does with the government bailout of FDIC in place? There be less banks. Less banks, perhaps. Not necessarily, though. There could be still competition, but it might choose to be, there, there might end up being some more banks. Think about choosing the money, like, now we have to think about it. Do I put it at Wells Fargo, Bank of America, First National Bank, State Savings Bank? You know, where do I want to place my money when, when there's no insurance? Just like your car insurance, there's no insurance. How does that change your driving, right? Okay, so now, we might start, so what do you mean by a bank being more risk averse? Okay, so back to how the bank makes money. They take your money and they loan it out, right? And who are they loaning it out to? Well, most of the time we don't know that. Do you think we might check out some reports if our money wasn't 100% covered by the government? Now, think that a step further now. So now we're gonna be doing our research. 
Who's getting our money? Who's the banks that are winning and losing in the marketplace? Who's the winners? Who's the losers? Now that we have market discipline by the depositors, thinking about where they put it for the reasons like Joe brought up. Who are the winners? Who are the losers? So you can kind of run with, I mean, Joe, Joe kind of hit it on where the money's going. So who's going to be the banks that are around the longest? Matt, you look like you're at the bed here. Um, would the losers be the, the borrowers because they are essentially they could be borrowing their own money at a higher interest rate than what they're being given? Um, so, not necessarily. I guess to, to, to answer kind of short, but then let me back up. So I want to think about the long-term healthiness, not the current status of the people borrowing, uh, because I think the borrowers could potentially win in this situation. And, and the reason is, is that if the market is more efficient, then that should bring interest rates actually down for borrowers also. And competitive, so back to what Eric said, if there's less banks. So provided that there's healthy competition, we got banks fighting for your business. Remember, think of it that way. We should have efficient interest rates and possibly even lower that way. Who is the who are the banks that are surviving in this environment? How do they make money again? Joe, go, go ahead. Yes, uh, the banks that do the best loans. Okay. So the banks that are putting their money to work the best finding the less risky investments potentially for the bank for the buck, remember, with risk and interest rates. So they're really doing their thing. Those banks that are, are actively being a safe place, because do you think depositors would value really risky behavior on banks' parts? Not without the insurance there. That's my hard-earned savings. I want to know that my money's going to be there for sure. So who's going to get rewarded are banks that are making really safe, strong, not necessarily high interest rate because there's not going to be high risk, but people are going to value that safety because the last thing they want to do is lose their money, right? Especially that type of money. This is not retirement savings, right? I mean, I'm talking about liquidity, about your savings account that, hey, I want to buy a laptop computer next year. I need to start saving some money. It's that type of savings, not retirement investments, right? We're thinking about money that needs to be kept really safe. If we had market discipline of this sort, we'd see a different type of creature out there. But now what we see is a depositor who doesn't care that the government's going to bail them out, which is effectively kind of bailing out the risky behavior of the banks. So this all kind of leads to more risky loans um, occurring in the, in the banking system overall. All right, so financial institutions. Uh, actually, let me comment on the market discipline thing first. Kind of rolls into the next bullet. But, um, so let me just put up caveat emptor. Anybody remember what that is? Caveat emptor. Buyer beware. I actually put buyer beware up there, but we don't have to know the Latin. So caveat emptor, buyer beware, um, you're going to seek out strong buyer will seek strong, safe bank. That's who the winner is going to be in a free market that doesn't have FDIC insurance. Buyer is going to seek out a safe, strong, safe bank. <coughs> Maybe they're going to make some errors. Some people are going to get burned. And that's the whole idea of coming back to FDIC insurance. So I'm not trying to back off, by the way, and be anti-FDIC. I don't necessarily think this would be the way to go, although there might be some variations that are more market-driven that would be. All right, let me just uh, put this last one, uh, and then we'll be done. Financial institutions have incentive to take on greater risk. So let's just call them banks. Banks have... Uh, incentive 
incentive to take on additional risk. All right, we will call it a day there. Okay, so Kaylee, um, as long as you're here, you basically asked for a letter of recommendation. Program. There's a tab on there Okay. I will be happy to do it, of course. So that's good. When is the due date and stuff? Okay. Okay. Uh, we did. 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 U